Well, you can't say I didn't warn you. We'll wait for folks to come back. <clears throat> I'm not at all surprised. I had a had a feeling that was going to happen. Um, I, 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 that's why I gave you the warning, because you know the Bible says that the devil is the prince of the power of the air, and all of this is happening in in the air. You, you're, you, I'm broadcasting wirelessly all of this is going through the air so the devil is the prince of the power of the air so we just need to pray that he doesn't is not able to continue doing this what's interesting about what happens is i'll be i'll be talking to you on facebook live and all of a sudden my phone will go black and then it will it will just go right back to my home screen and it'll show me my little icons on my phone and then Facebook, the Facebook icon, will say cleaning underneath it. And so my question, Facebook, is why do you always want to clean while I'm preaching or teaching the Word of God? All right? Because it's very, very clear because the enemy doesn't like what's happening here, and he always fights what he doesn't like. And so we're, we're back on, and we're going to have more folks join back with us, I hope, because we still have much to say about this. And so we're going to persevere on. He's not going to win. We're going to keep going. All right? Thank you for coming back on. Let me just, <clears throat> let me just pick up where I left off. And again, I, I warned you that this might happen based on the subject matter that we're talking about. This is a crazy, chaotic, and confused world that we're living in right now. And folks, the reason it's crazy, chaotic, and confused is because there's an enemy. There's an enemy behind it all. An enemy who is violent, bloodthirsty, evil, and insane. I'm serious. And unless you're living under a rock, you have probably noticed that the devil has unleashed his demons in this world and they are running loose and rampant. Now, does that frighten you? Does it, does it frighten you for your family, your children, your grandchildren? You say, well, what about, what about you, preacher? Does it frighten you? Well, I've thought about that. And, and here's my answer to that. It would, it really would frighten me if I didn't know what I know. I would, I would be terrified if it were not for what I know. You see, we're talking about the belt of truth. And what I know is the truth. I know the truth of God. I know the truth of God's Word. And, and, and God's Word tells me that my Savior, Jesus, has won the victory. My Savior, Jesus, has power over the enemy. My Savior, Jesus, will never leave me or forsake me. My Savior, Jesus, holds me in his hand and no one can pluck me out. My Savior, Jesus, is far, far more powerful than my enemy. That's why I'm called to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And it's his armor that I'm to put on, not my own. My Savior, Jesus, is on his way back soon. So I'm not terrified of the devil. I'm aware of the truth. And the truth is, one of these days, I'm going to hear a shout, I'm going to hear a trumpet blast, and heaven's vacuum cleaner is going to suck me right up out of the devil's world, and I'm going to be with my Father in heaven for all eternity. So no, I'm not terrified. Not at all. All of that that I just shared with you comes from putting on the belt of truth. You know, Jack Graham at Prestonwood Baptist Church said this, Don't go to battle without your belt on. You'll lose your pants, and you might just lose your life. <laughs> That's good stuff. Well, moving on to the second, second gear item is also mentioned in verse 14. It's the breastplate of righteousness. 
breastplate. Well, you know what that would, that, that's going to do. That's going to cover your heart. It's going to cover all your vital organs, and it's really essential uh, in, in a battle. Um, and here's the thing. The devil wants to give you and me spiritual heart disease. He wants access to our hearts. He wants to defile us. You see, the crazy thing is, the same devil who attacks you at your weaknesses and points them out to you is the same devil who's supplying you with the goods or with the bads in this case. He, he accuses you of your sin and yet the very one who accuses you of your sin is working o overtime to entice you to sin. He's your provider as well as your accuser in all things sinful. It's, it's like a weight loss coach who scolds you for gaining weight during the day and slides Twinkies and candy under your door every night. That's what the devil is. I recently heard about a, a man who's a boss. And this man, this boss, installed tracking devices on the work vehicles of his employees. Now, that's nothing un uncommon, nothing wrong with that. But this guy wanted to catch his workers loafing or being somewhere other than where they were supposed to be. And when he couldn't catch them loafing or doing anything wrong, he would tamper with their tracking device on their truck, disconnect it, and then accuse them of tampering with it themselves just so he could fire them. Now, folks, that's how the devil operates. He puts it out there for you and supplies it to you and then accuses you of what he has supplied you. Remember, we're putting all this stuff on. We're gearing up. We're suiting up. We are active duty, and we are to actively put on righteousness. But it's not our righteousness. We don't have any. We, we don't have any. Ours isn't any good. We stand in the righteousness of Christ. That's where our righteousness comes from. Verse 15 talks about having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Interesting language. We don't really, you know, we talk, when we talk about shodding, we usually are, are talking about some type of horse. We, we you know, but, but this, is, uh, this is where that word came from for horses. It's getting the feet ready. It's having something on those feet for protection. I call this holy footwear. Um, obviously, footwear is important. Not as important as some of your closets reveal, but it is important. And it was especially important for the soldier. His feet needed to keep him protected from, uh, oftentimes, the enemy would, uh, sort of like the, the pongee pong 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 sticks um, that were stuck into the ground and people would step on them and they would drive them through their feet. There were Those types of tactics were being done uh, in Jesus' day, in the New Testament day as well. Um, he also, the, the soldier would need a, a cleat-like tread on his sandals or on his shoes to help him stand firm when he was engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But why does the Christian need holy footwear? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Our, our feet really need to be well taken care of because they take us to the places where we're to share the gospel. So, so we need to take care of our feet. But there's another reason we need holy footwear. We need to be able to stand up, stand firm, and stand strong for long periods of time. You see, God knows how easy it is for us to get knocked down. The enemy is tricky, cunning, and deceitful. He doesn't typically bull rush us or, or come at us like a linebacker. He loves to attack, but his attacks are a whole lot more subtle. You see, he knows that courage accompanies faith, so he tricks us into discouragement. He knows that joy accompanies light, so he lies to us about ourselves, hoping that we will move away from the light and into the darkness of depression. That's how he typically attacks. And that's why our feet need to be firmly planted in the peace of the gospel. How can we stand strong? How can we stand firm? By remembering how the gospel brought peace to our hearts. When we remember that, then, then we grow determined to take the gospel of peace to others. So you see, we're not only to be stable, we're to be mobile with the good news that our neighbors and this world need most. Well, verse 16 gives us the next piece of our, 
of our equipment that we need to suit up with, and that's the shield of faith. But when the flaming arrows of doubt are flung in our direction, we need to put off the shield of faith. The, the Roman shields <clears throat> were about four feet tall and two feet wide, and it was enough where a soldier could crouch down behind it safely when those arrows would, would be shot at them. Many times it wasn't just one or two arrows coming at them. It, it was a whole garrison of folks that were shooting arrows all at once. And so the soldier would put his shield up and he would crouch down and he would hold that in front of him. And, and he could hide behind that safely against those arrows. Well, several soldiers... Would, would typically form a circle with each other and they were able, their, their, sword, their shields were designed so that they were able to lock sh their shield with another person's shield. They could form a circle, everyone crouched behind that circle and they could use their shields to make a geodesic defensive structure that kept everyone safe from the archer's arrow. And folks, this is the picture that I want to see our ministry do especially for those of you who cannot or do not wish to gather corporately for worship because of health concerns. I want to provide an outlet for you to be able to join shields with one another, for all of us to be able to connect our shields to each other in this battle. Some of you are physically alone, but I want you to know that you are not spiritually or emotionally alone. You're one of us. And, and we're here to pray for you. We're here to share God's word with you. We're here to give you a place to belong. You're part of us. And we want to connect our shields with your shield because we're stronger together when our shields of faith are connected. You know, I'd, I'd like for you to give some emojis to that. I wish we had some shield emojis, but you can give whatever you want, a heart or a thumbs up because we definitely need each other and need to be here for each other. So, so what does the Bible say this shield is all about? Well, it's all about faith. Let me ask you another question. What does the Bible say is the source of our victory? What is it that overcomes the world? Well, Jesus said it was faith. Faith is what overcomes the world. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So the shield of faith. The next piece is in verse 17. It's the helmet of salvation. Uh, in this battle, you need to wear a helmet, not a mask. Helmets, have you noticed, have become a big deal in sports, especially football. In fact, millions of dollars are being spent in research on helmets to make them, uh, to make them more protective from brain injuries and from head injuries in athletes. Um, some of you probably wore helmets that uh, didn't protect you very well back in your day. I remember when I was a skinny little sixth grader, I, I put on a helmet and pads and played football at Stephen F. Austin Junior High School in Beaumont, Texas. And uh, one of the, during one of the practices, <clears throat> our coach thought it would be fun to play a game called Bull in the Ring. I'm not sure if you know what Bull in the Ring is. Um, bull in the Ring is where one player stands in the middle, he's the bull, and then a circle of other football players gather around him. Let's say there's 12 of them. And all of them are facing the bull in the ring. And every perimeter player is given an assigned number, 1 through 12, let's say, like, a, like, a, like on the face of a clock. And so the coach, would, the coach would blow the whistle and call out a number. And so that numbered player was when his number was called, he was to lunge at and hit the guy in the middle, the bull in the middle, to try to knock him down. He would hit him as hard as he could. And the guy in the middle was supposed to be aware enough to know where number 12 was and where number 6 was and where number 3 was and where number 9 was so that when the coach blew the whistle and called out a number, he could turn in a defensive stance and be ready to take that hit. Well... Guess who got to be the bull in the ring? The skinniest, scrawniest sixth grader on the football team. You're looking at him. Guess who was so skinny that his pants fell down easily? Guess whose helmet could spin all the way around his face? That's right, you're looking at him. I was so busy holding up my pants with one hand and trying to twist my helmet back around with my other hand, I never stood a chance. There's a reason I still remember being the bull in the ring. 
There's a lot about junior high school that I've forgotten, but that day changed my life. And it probably explains quite a few things about the way I think. Well, folks, helmets are important because the brain is the control center of our emotions, our thoughts, our will, and, and one other thing. Um, oh, yeah, our memory. <laughs> our memory. The enemy wants to take our minds and our thoughts captive. He wants to be in control of these mental movies that play in the cinema of our minds. This is how he wages war against us. He fights to control and feed our thoughts with sin, with fear, and with evil. But he wants to do more than show movies. The Bible tells us that he wants to build strongholds in our minds. This is where 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 4, comes into play. A stronghold is a, like a mental fortress inside your mind where Satan sets up camp. It's a little piece of territory that he gets, and he wants to expand it. The root word for stronghold means cement, something that's stuck in your head. Satan's goal is to take over more and more territory of your thoughts, which lead to your actions. So how do you fend him off? How do you keep him out? How do you get rid of a stronghold if he's already set up camp in your mind? Well, you need the weapons of heaven. You need the spiritual firepower, powerful enough to make the enemy flee. And, and that's why I believe God had Paul put the helmet of salvation next to the sword of the Spirit, which is the one we're going to look at next, which is the Word of God. We're going to look at that next, but the first thing you need to do, my friend, if, if you're dealing with this battle of the enemy having a stronghold in your mind, the first thing you need to do is ask the Holy Spirit to reveal any and every and all sin in your life. In order to re remove the enemy's strongholds, you need to confess and repent of every sin that has not yet been confessed or covered by the blood of Jesus. That sin is how the devil got in. That's how he's able to build a stronghold. To get his stronghold out of your mind, you need to repent of that sin. Turn away from that sin. Ask God to forgive you of that sin and turn control of your mind over to the Holy Spirit. And so also there in verse 17, uh, the, 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 the last piece of battle gear is the sword of the Spirit. Uh, don't you dare go into this battle with a bottle of sanitizer. You need a Satanizer. The only weapon that kills the influence of Satan is the Word of God. That's the Satanizer. It's the only offensive weapon on this entire list, and it's the only weapon that Jesus used to fight off the devil. So once you've repented of your sin, you need to re-enthrone Jesus as Lord of your life. So, so if you've got a stronghold built up in your, in your mind, the devil, devil has some enemy territory there he's, that he's captivated in your mind, and you keep, you keep making the same mistakes, you keep committing the same sins, you keep being discouraged by the same things, or you keep being held back or held down, it's all because of that sin there. So you need to, you need to repent first. Then you need to re-enthrone Jesus as Lord of your life. Surrender the throne of your life to his ownership of your mind, body, and soul. And then third, you need to ask God to renew your mind. Renew your mind. If there are any strongholds of the enemy in there, you need to ask God to demolish them to rubble. And the way you renew your mind is to then begin replacing all those evil and sinful thoughts with Scripture. With Scripture. That's why the Bible is so important to us. And then fourth, you need to rebuild godly fortresses of truth. Rebuild holy habits of personal purity in your life. This is part of that renewal process. And the way you rebuild those godly fortresses is exactly what you're doing right now. It's by the teaching and the discipleship of the Word of God that takes place when we gather together, we open His Word, His Word begins to work in you like it's doing right now, cleansing and sanctifying and purifying you and helping you, helping us, all of us, to develop new patterns and new ways of thinking. Listen, discipleship is a lifelong process. There, there is no quick fix. This is a battle and your mind is a battlefield. And so we need to retrain our brain 
by replacing our thoughts of evil with thoughts of God. And finally, you need to resist the devil in the name of Jesus. In the authority of the one who purchased you. If you're a Christian, if you're a born-again believer in Christ, Jesus Christ has the rights to you. He, he is the owner of your, of your soul, your mind, your body, your entire being. And so you don't belong to the devil. And so if the devil is setting up strongholds in your mind, he's a freeloading bum. He's an unwelcome, uninvited trespasser inside your head. Toss the bum out in Jesus' name. Stand and resist him in the name of Jesus, in the blood of Jesus, and by the authority of the word of God. You can stand against him. God's word gives it to us, right? And the last, or the fifth thing that we need to do, there's two more. After we suit up, we need to pray up. In fact, we need to pray up the, through the entire process. The, the entirety of this process needs to be covered in prayer. Putting on the armor of God. When you put on the helmet of salvation, you need to be praying. Lord, you have saved me. You've cleansed me. I'm blood bought. And you need to be praying about that. When you put on the breastplate of righteousness, you need to be praying. Lord, cover me with your righteousness, not my own. As you put on each piece of this, of this armor, you need to pray. It should be done in prayer. Look at verse 18. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now, the goal in this battle is to advance the gospel. You see, it's a battlefield. And Satan is trying to keep lost people lost and save people distracted. And he's also trying to keep saved people away from lost people so that the light doesn't shine on their darkness. So our goal in this battle and the goal of the Lord Jesus Christ for us in this battle is that we advance the gospel. We take the good news to people who don't know it. Look at verse 19 and 20. Paul says, And pray for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. In other words, he's in prison as he's writing this, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Let me ask you, do you think Paul's the only one that ought to speak boldly? No. He says, pray for me that I can speak boldly. Folks, prayer is like our offensive line. Our offensive line engages the enemy and creates lanes for the gospel to get through. Prayer's not the end. If the goal is to advance the gospel, then how can anyone hear unless someone talks. And so the last thing we learn from Paul's example in Ephesians is that we need to speak up. As we pray up, we also need to speak up. I just read to you verses 19 and 20 where Paul asks for boldness to share the gospel to anyone and everyone he could reach. Now, like I said, he's a prisoner. How many people can he possibly touch? How many people can he advance the gospel to? Well, come to think of it, quite a few. He's in a prisoner, but he can speak up to the guards. He can speak up to other prisoners. And even though he's a prisoner, he couldn't get out, but others could get in. And he could speak the word of God to them with boldness. Oh, and by the way, he could take a pen and a parchment and he could speak the gospel to so many people that even to this day, his boldness is still a witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was in prison. And yet he spoke with boldness the word of God. What's our excuse? I mean, his word of testimony to the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ has been read by billions of people. And his voice that Satan tried to silence is still being heard around the world today. Don't bring a casserole to a sword fight. Put on the armor of God. When you do... As a Christian, you're dressed for success. You're dressed in the spirit of Christ. You see, the armor of God is actually Jesus Christ himself fighting the battle for you on your behalf, doing the spiritual work, the invisible work that you can't see, but it's something you are completely engaged in with him. But make no mistake about it. 
It's not your armor. It's his. And he is, in fact, your armor. Because this talks about the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. Well, who is truth? Jesus is truth. Whose righteousness are we talking about? Jesus' righteousness. He is our peace. He is our strength. He is our protector. He is our hope. He is, he is the living word of God. He is the sword of the Spirit. And so put on the Lord Jesus Christ and get on your feet in his name. The victory is yours because the victory is his. Battle in his name. Battle for his glory. And let's just see what God can do against the forces of darkness in every corner of our mind and in every corner of this world. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit examines every portion of our mind. If there's anything in there that the enemy has taken over, right now, Father, we confess that. We confess whatever sin allowed him to get in, and we ask you to, to evict him and to cleanse us of sin. We ask you, Father, to, 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 uh, to take the throne of our heart. And put, we just right now, we put Jesus as the Lord and ruler over our lives. And Father, we ask you to renew our minds. Help us, Lord, to continue to be in the process of discipleship every day, putting on this armor with prayer and being a part of this battle. And Father, I pray for my fellow soldiers who are listening right now that you would strengthen them, embolden them, every one of them, and myself included, to be fervent, strong, powerful witnesses for the gospel of Christ. May you use this word and this testimony today to, the, to your honor and to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you, folks. We made it, <clears throat> and we're going to claim that God's going to get the victory from this. Uh, just remember Tuesdays at 7 o'clock. We have our Bible study time going through the gospel accounts. Uh, and remember to give us your prayer requests. Um, it's so awesome today. We've already heard uh, of some more answers to prayer. Praise God. Hallelujah. Uh, so amazing. And so we just continue to, uh, to lift one another up in prayer, to join our shields to each other, and to stay engaged in this battle. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you later.